or something. But just let me know what it was. All right, we were working on this beauty the other day, and so we'll continue uh, our look at it. How far have we got? I think we looked at, at that first, uh, the lower part of the jaw here. We looked at that. Remember, what we're trying to find is how much force is exerted at E based upon an input back here by the user of 150. So that's the deal, right? We looked at the first jaw. We're just starting on the upper part. So we, we had, and uh, my recommendation again is that you kind of keep these parts, as you take them apart, keep them about in the same place where they, where they lie in the machine. You're just less likely to make a mistake then. So we had uh, C and D, and we're looking for how much force it exerts at E. And we couldn't get to that because we had uh, too many unknowns on this, this original piece that we looked at, the lower jaw. And I think I put the forces like that, is that right? Remember, for the most part, it's, it's not too crucial. Think about it a little bit, but don't waste too much time on trying to get the little individual directions. Um, because it all comes out in the wash anyway. Alright, so now we're looking at the upper jaw, the, uh, the long handle here. Oh, this thing's beautiful. You just, you just gotta love it. And then we've got, we've got point C there again. There's the other side of E. So C will turn around because it's equal and opposite to whatever we've got there. We don't have those yet. So uh, we don't have that. And then uh, I think we talked a little bit about what was going on at that link A, uh, the pin A, which is about there maybe. What was the deal with that one? We, we figured out a little bit about it, uh, the forces that are there. Yeah, it's, that's a pin connection with a two-force member, which means we're going to know where um, we're going to know the uh, the uh, inclination, I guess you could say of that piece because uh, AB itself is a two force member so we know that the forces are going to be lined up right along there. It doesn't mean when you go to analyze the forces at that point if you need to that it's not still useful to break them into their component directions. What it does mean though is that there's uh, less uh, uh, not the same number of unknowns that we might have had otherwise. Because now we know the direction of A and B. Uh, so you can still break it into the, uh, the component directions if you need to, but uh, there was a related by the sines and cosines of the angle anyway, so it's not really anything we would have done differently. It's just less unknowns now. All right. So, uh, I think that's where we, oh, there was, there was the uh, 150 input load there. We're trying to find out, given that, how much force is exerted by the machine uh, at, its, uh, at its contact with, the, with whatever it is that's cutting through it at uh, point E. So, what's next? We have still one, two, three, 
and four unknowns. That angle's not unknown anymore, but uh, I think it's 20, 23.2 degrees. So we still have, we, we have, we have three, four unknowns with that one still. E, the direction of magnitude of C, and the magnitude of A is still unknown. So we can't do that piece yet either. So what? There's a, there's only one unknown with part, part AB. Right, we just don't know the magnitude. We know the angle. So can we do that one? If we knew A or B, we know that we'd only have three unknowns. We could finish the part with the uh, top jaw. Can we do part A B with only a single unknown? All we get out of AB is what we already know anyway, which is these are equal and opposite. We don't have a moment equation we can apply here, remember? So the only two equations we have are the uh, sum of the forces in the x and the y, and because of the nature of this, those aren't independent, so we don't have uh, anything else we can do but say A equals B. Can you treat the top? Treat this as what? As if it can't move, and then just do a moment with everything else. Well, the parts can move, but we're not analyzing them while they're moving. So none of these things move anyway. We can take the moment about any point we want. We're looking for the static analysis with that load. What's the force here? Even though the parts can move, they're not moving. Well, I was saying use the 150 newtons with everything but the top piece. C and then you can get the force at A. Everything but this? Yep. And then use the other three pieces as if they're rigid and do a moment about C and then you should be able to get the force at A or at least get the Y force at A. Do the moments about what point? C. But you still have forces at D, B, A, and E. Just because the piece, top piece, if you take the Those top are piece. Forces. I'm just saying use the, use the known 150 units. Great. Uh, maybe All right, well, let's see. I have to draw it to see. Okay, so we've got the lower piece, we've got the, the length, and then we've got the lower jaw. So just something as beautiful as that looks, right? Yeah. We have the 150 there, we have E there, and then we have the forces at C, and just the force at A. Right? That's what you're saying? Yeah. How many unknowns is that? Yeah, it's still, it's still four unknowns. It's a good try but it's still four unknowns. Uh, doesn't mean we might not have to come to that. Oh, wait a second. Oh, sorry. I can't wait a second. If you were doing a moment about C, the two late before Back to the tape up. What? If you were doing a moment about C, those two forces that C would matter, there would be two unknowns. It would be just E and M. Oh, and I have to draw it again. <laughs> This thing that is ugly enough as it is, it's really ugly when it's just the piece. All right, so we've got the 150 there, E there. We're going to take the moment about C, so that point doesn't matter. And then we have uh, 
we have A there. Right? That's more the picture now you're talking of? Yeah. And we don't have to worry about C. We do the moment about C. Right. We don't have to worry about AX. We have AY, E, and E, right? AY, E? What? No, you have AY, you have E, you have 150, right? Because the AX would cancel out because it goes through C. Why does A. Oh, A, yeah, A is lined up with C. So I can prove, prove the drawing a little bit with that. Right. So if we did break that into components, we only have a y. So could we then find e from that? Two on, well, there's, there's four unknowns because the, the relationship between these two is not unknown. Just the, the magnitude. If you find the magnitude of one of them, you'll know the magnitude of the other because you know the angle. Um, so there's, there's still four unknowns, but if we sum the moments about C, we'll have... Uh, a, Y, and E in the same equation, then what? I mean, that's, that's okay. Uh, still, we're going to need other parts in here. We're, st we're still going to need, so it, it kind of gets down to maybe you like doing that and you can start to solve it from there. Somewhere you have to start getting the parts. Somewhere you have to hope that I don't have too many unknowns um, because this is still four unknowns and it's the same same unknowns as are in this piece. So you're not going to be able to go to this piece. You can have exactly the same equations. So uh, what I guess the last thing to look at is the bottom piece. We haven't looked at that yet. We have that there. We have B. B about here. We know its angle. And then we have, uh, we have D here. Alright. So, can we do that one? Yeah, that one we can do. We only have three unknowns. And it's a, uh, it's, it's the, the three contact points uh, where the forces are applied are not collinear. Remember, if they're collinear, we still couldn't solve that. But they're not. So that one, that one, then we can solve. We can solve that. Um, what's the most efficient route? Probably solve it for dx dy, and then we could solve for e here. So if we solve for. Actually, we don't even need dx dy. We need. Uh, we need dx. So then we could sum the moments about C, and we'd have dx, and then we could find E. All right, so take, take a couple minutes to, to flesh that out a little bit. Should be able to bring it to, uh, bring it to a conclusion. You could, if you want, make a three-fourths member out of this. I don't know if it's going to help much. Because remember, with a three-force member, everything goes through a single point. All the forces must go through a single point. That, if you can find that point, would then give you 
the direction of the force D, and that's one less unknown. That's, that's a separate equation you can bring in, if you will. But it's not an additional one, it's just a separate one. Because once you link those, they're not independent then. Looks like it's pretty straightforward summing the forces, summing the moments about some chosen point. Probably uh, most of you where you want to sum the moments. If you sum them about D, you only have one unknown then. In that equation. I like some of these drawings. Some of these are pretty darn good. I was going to go do this on, uh, on uh, solid things now. By the way, for your project, you, I mean, uh, especially if you're in SolidWorks now, is that just, uh, it's just you? Find the final project in SolidWorks with your final project in here.
does not count as an independent equation. Just write that down when I say it.
uh, different angles. Because this is just one setting we have here. But you could put all kinds of different pieces in there. So there's there's a lot more offer. Do you want that? It's tempting. That's that's why we have this permanently set at a low setting, so you can't actually oh, wait, maybe you can get your finger in there. This one's nice to get all the dimensions off of it uh, without a lot of trouble. You can always go buy something from the law, just take the dimensions and then take it back. Or a couple of you probably have stuff like this in your trunk anyway. Have the same bolt cutters work. Very good at removing rest of shoes. Yep. Now, what's the mechanical advantage? And uh, where do you have to pay for that mechanical advantage? The mechanical advantage is the multiplication of the input to get the output. So, the mechanical advantage, I don't think we really have a symbol for it, is uh, the output, which is what you get at E, the reason we're doing this, divided by the input. Usually, that's greater than 1 because you want to take the relatively feeble human hand and turn it into many, many times that force uh, on, the, on the piece. However, there's somewhere where you have to pay for that um, in some way. Uh, I use the word pay. For example, you've used a, a block and tackle before and put a certain amount of force on the chain and you multiply that force a lot so you can lift something very heavy. But to do that, you got to pull a whole bunch of chain. In fact, it's by the same factor. If you lift something 10 times, then you're going to have to pull 10 times as much chain. So it's the same kind of thing here. However, like with a block and tackle, sometimes that, that cost is more than worth it. You know, it's, it's kind of a pain to pull all that chain. No, that's your cost. So. Yeah, right. No, because it's too far apart. Okay. No, it's well, not. In, in, in real bolt pumps. I can't help but what you have over there. You can't you use that with one. Put it across the Put bolt your hand bolt. in there. Put it across the Okay, Trevor, he wants your finger in there. Put it across the bolt. No, that's, that's, that's. Well, yeah, kind of. That's the cost. We'll, we'll talk about it in a second when we have the numbers. Bill, you got something? Got some answers there? Almost. Dana. Almost. We got a couple people coming up with the right numbers. So we've got the mechanical advantage now. Now there are situations where you might want your there are situations where you might want that decreased if you're doing something very sensitive like if you uh, have a pair of calipers and you're trying to lift a blood vessel during surgery you don't want to smash it so you want the multiplication yeah I know That's, yeah, I lost my medical license too when you smash blood vessels. Plus, the difference is that they point D back. I think with the bolt cutters in point D, well, it won't be perpendicular or parallel. Yeah, it won't be directly underneath point C. And the bolt cutters are closed. Up until that point, it's, it's to the left of C, so that you can get to a bank. CX, or DY, right now you're only getting DX. But if you move it back, if, if D moves to the left? Yes. Because then you get a moment using the entire force of it. No, that would be the wrong way because 
Uh, oh yeah, because this would be down. It'll be moving it down, down over. And it'll add to the moment of yeah. the seat. And, then, yeah. and then I think with rear bolt cutters, it doesn't actually come, come directly underneath the other pin until bolt cutters are closed. Well, these are my bolt cutters. Plus, you don't know if we're trying to cut the thing at E or just hang on to it. Pliers only hang on to things. You know, if you're looking at vice grips, their purpose is just to hang on to something. And so uh, that's different than if we want to cut it. And there's another thing we have to do with this, with this kind of project, and we'll talk about it in a couple weeks, is the fact that if you're trying to cut through something, we have this wedge shape, and we're going to talk about how that uh, works as well in a couple weeks. So that's something that would come into account if uh, you had cutters instead of regular pliers. All right, so I think we're pretty much there. Dana, did you get it finally? So it looks like something around 15, 20 newtons, give or take a little bit. For an input of 150, so a mechanical advantage of a little over 10. Meaning that for every newton of input, there's 10 newtons of output. Actually, it doesn't even have to be newtons. It could be pounds, too. It worked just the same. Is that what we did with the suitcase thing? And the, the, I don't know, were you talking about the suitcase thing? Uh, yeah, the kind of. But, but that was just a simple, a level, le, a simple lever arm. You have a long handle that could lift 150 that's down closer to the fulcrum because your hand's way far out and you don't have to lift it with 100 or 50 pounds, I think it was. And where's, it, where's the, there's a cost of 10 somewhere in the use of this thing. And it's that for every unit of closure of the jaws, you're going to have to move the handle 10 times that. But if that's what you need, if you need that 100, uh, 1,500 newton output, that's not that's not much cost at all. So you're you're more than likely willing to put up with this. Okay. Any questions for the next thing we can look at? All right. This will this will be our last machine. I'll leave it to you. Bonus points, however, if you do it with uh, um, well, how should I put it? Uh, if you do it with a uh, a force triangle, maybe I'll just leave it to you to figure out what that means at first. So imagine we have some kind of trap door thing. And it's run by, by hydraulic actuator. Something like that. Simple trap door. Half a meter on either side.
find the forces at A and at C. Statics class, so we're not looking at it necessarily while it's opening, uh, just a static analysis of different points in between. That's kind of by range of motion. So, who's going to put first dibs on that bolt cutter for the project? Some of the things in the project, as you start thinking towards that, we might not necessarily have yet, but you can certainly get started on it. Uh, like if the, we're talking about the cutter there, we haven't talked about wedges yet. They're pretty straightforward um, for most applications.
maybe not necessarily the order they're in. questions?
I don't well, always fill in all that stuff because I kind of go fast. You know? Yeah, well, and then you finish early, but and it's spend, right. instead of spending the time filling in what's missing because you went fast, you spend the time defending it. Well, I'm an artist, so I can see things on the page that you don't see. Uh, <laughs> you definitely can see things on the page I can't see. That is very true. I don't dispute that for one second. All right, so most of you have that. have a free body diagram of the door itself, which is what we're going to need because that's where the forces are. I think most of you got that that actuator is a two-force member because no matter what its length is or what force it's applying, it's still only pinned at either end. So that's a two-force member. Call that uh, B, I guess. And we know its angle. At A, we have a simple pin. And what do we have at C? Meaning, what kind of force does that exert on the door, ABC? The point of the roller is that there's no lateral force, then there's only a vertical force. So that's all we have at C then, is just that piece. And then the other part, well, we can at least get A, X would do that, and uh, probably A, Y does that. Because that actuator tends to lift the door up either way. Some of the moments about A, that will allow you then to find C directly, because you'll have the part of BX and BY. And BX goes through A, BY we know because you know the angle and the magnitude from that you can find then C. Dy at half a meter must equal C at the full meter moment arm. And we know what Dy is, so you can find C from that directly. Which is 212. Right? You got that, BJ? And then you can, uh, then now that you have BY and C, you can solve for AY. And you get AY equal to, also equal to 212. Boy, that uh, 45 degree angle is convenient. Just when you need a 45 degree angle, there's there is one. And then you can get AX from uh, just the, being the part of uh, to oppose BY. Now, that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at the problem is to realize that all of the forces must sum to zero. And you know the direction of two of them, which means, and there's only three, which means you can draw the force triangle 
that uh, represents that and you can solve for it. Not necessarily a better way, not necessarily an easier way, just another way to look at the problem. So we, uh, we don't know which angle A is going to be, but we do know which angle C is. And we know that all three added together is going to equal zero, which means that uh, so A plus B, well, what's the easier way to set this up? Oh yeah, B we know is at 45. So we know that's 45, and we know how long that is. We know that that would be drawn to scale as six kilonewtons. And then A must close the triangle because otherwise they don't sum to zero. And then when you've got that, you can use the law of sines and the law of cosines as needed to find any of the parts that are missing. That's what you were talking about. You thought that was trying to make the force triangle with that. That was just my A triangle. Oh. A force triangle. Oh. I hope you people understand what I go through when I grade out the papers. <laughs> I, I know the answer's in there somewhere. I just have to dig and dig and dig, but it's usually in there. All right, any questions? Don't forget to go check the project announcement, and uh, don't miss that. Uh,